Yeah, I thought I'd uh, put a little bit uh, of this into perspective. So I'll, I'll cover a number of these um, ash transport models. There's at least a dozen out there that are used for various things, mostly for um, aviation safety issues. Um, so so I, I hope it'll give you a little bit more perspective on, on those, those kinds of questions. Um, so the, what I'm going to talk about uh, is outlined here. This is really an outline more than an introduction, but it also goes over what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the first main point is that the early spread of a volcanic cloud is driven, driven by gravity. And uh, part of that is that umbrella cloud spreading that we've talked about. There's also uh, other spreading that goes on that's gravity driven. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, while the, the cloud is spreading by gravity and then ultimately by atmospheric motions, there's settling that's going on uh, of the particles. And that's, of course, a, a process that's always controlled by gravity, although it actually goes on in a way that you don't necessarily expect at first. Um, uh, once the uh, a volcanic plume's been in the atmosphere for a while, it's completely subject to the atmospheric circulation, uh, uh, as Alexa just, just mentioned. And uh, the relationship of the, the volcanic cloud in size to the eddies uh, and, and the other structures that make up the atmosphere is really important to how um, the, a volcanic cloud gets dispersed in the atmosphere. Uh, so I'll take a look at that. Uh, and then uh, we'll look at some examples of, of, uh, of eruptions over the past 20 years or so that have provided good examples for how uh, volcanic clouds work. So we've talked, uh, John talked about this a little bit. Near event, there's uh, several main sort of end member categories to how a volcanic plume acts. A uh, regular Plinian style eruption, you have a, 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 a vertical, vertically directed eruption column going up from the vent and then spreading at height in the atmosphere around a height of neutral buoyancy in the atmosphere. That means where the, the material in the plume becomes the same density as the, the surrounding atmosphere. When it gets to that level, it, it spreads by pressure gradients outward as a, as a gravity current to make the umbrella cloud. Pretty much the same thing goes on in a coignimbrite plume. So you have an eruption from the vent that creates uh, pyroclastic flows. And coming up off of the uh, upper part of the ignimbrite is a coignimbrite plume. Uh, that rises into the atmosphere in a very similar way to, to this, except it starts with basically a zero velocity at the, at the Earth's surface, and it comes from a much wider, uh, wider region. Uh, but those plumes can actually dominate, uh, dominate the eruption, and it'll spread at height in the atmosphere in the same way that, that a plume from the vent, vent spreads. If a plume is weak, which means uh, not, the velocities in the plume are low relative to uh, ambient wind speeds, uh, the plume can't really form the umbrella cloud in the atmosphere. It gets diluted too fast in the, in the wind field, and it becomes wh what we often term a bent-over plume and gets drafted downwind. It turns out uh, that, it, that for quite a while it actually does spread as a gravity current. Once it reaches this height in the atmosphere, it actually does slump and spread laterally, uh, but then it's uh, ultimately and, and quickly subject to, or more quickly subject to, atmospheric motions. Notice that the uh, velocities that you can get in these really strong eruptions, even in a coignimbrite plume at height in the plume, they can be up to several, a couple of several hundred meters uh, per second. So pretty, pretty good speeds. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about the vertically directed part of the, or the sub-vertically directed part of the eruption column because that's, uh, of the plume, because that's um, actually relatively little material can fall out of that has such strong uh, inflow speeds that particles uh, find it pretty difficult to escape uh, from the plume at, uh, in, in that regime. Most of the fallout starts happening once you get a plume spreading uh, in the atmosphere. And this is Grimsvoten in uh, 2011 spreading laterally in the atmosphere. Here's the vertically directed part of the eruption column. And then the, the smooth uh, shaped clouds are actually the gravity spreading of the umbrella cloud. Uh, at height in the atmosphere. <coughs> that gravity spreading uh, can persist for over a thousand kilometers and, and more than one day, uh, even in, in pretty small eruptions. Uh, so this is a pretty persistent uh, phenomenon. 
For pretty big eruptions, you get this uh, umbrella cloud shape, and then uh, for the smaller ones, you would get a, a, an elongate shape, and, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, but in both cases, they can keep spreading for, for quite a ways. Uh, the sedimentation from this thing is governed by the internal turbulence structure of the of the uh, vertical eruption column, but then also in the in the umbrella cloud itself. It is turbulent in there, even though the edges are pretty smooth. It has an internal uh, turbulence that's generated by the um, by uh, heat differences and particles, particle settling. So this remains turbulent, and and particles uh, settle from that uh, as from a turbulent uh, suspension. Uh, once again, once it uh, once it spreads and thins enough, uh, the plume uh, eventually becomes. Um, uh, n no longer a, a, an intrusion into the atmosphere, it becomes a thing that's a part of the atmosphere, really, and the particles are, are uh, s transported by the ambient atmospheric motions. This is uh, Sarachev Peak in 2009 eruption, pretty small eruption, actually, uh, not, very, not very large. Space shuttle picture, uh, and then satellite picture showing the, the, the spread of the uh, umbrella cloud from this relatively small eruption out to uh, over um, uh, 50, between 50 and 100 kilometers uh, pretty easily. A, even in the Ayafiat Yoka 2010 eruption, this was a very small eruption. We don't even usually care about this size of eruption, it's so small. But it's, at times it was a, a bent over plume, as in the, the inset picture there. Actually, there we go. Uh, times it was a bent over plume, as in, in this picture. Even so, uh, if you look downwind here, this material is actually spreading laterally in the crosswind direction in the atmosphere by gravity being, as it's being drafted downwind. Uh, at another time, uh, the winds were very weak. Notice it's got a vertically directed eruption column that only goes up a few kilometers. Uh, this, is actually, this would actually be considered a strong plume, though, because of this vertically directed eruption column and then spreading out as an umbrella cloud, even though it's... it's it's ultimately uh, not very much material coming out per, per time in that eruption. So it all depends on the relationship of how big the eruption is to the, the wind, the, to, to the wind speed. So the persistence uh, of gravity spreading, uh, as I said, can, can be quite uh, extreme. These are, none of these are particularly big eruptions um, that are shown here. For example, Pinatubo is not on this. This graph, but still, you can see that the gravity spreading in in these cases uh, persists. Uh, in the case of Mount St. Helens, that's the strongest of all these eruptions. That's going out uh, almost to a thousand kilometers, about seven hundred kilometers. It's still spreading by gravity. And Ayafiat Yokut is is one of these guys down here. It's spreading by gravity f at least out to a hundred uh, or two hundred kilometers from the vent. So it's pretty, pretty actually, uh, pretty persistent phenomenon. Um, so the, the real long range and global dispersion of, of the ash is controlled by the atmospheric circulation. After that gravity, after the density difference between the material and the, and the ambient atmosphere dies out. Um, at those scales then, you use uh, what are called numerical weather prediction models um, to provide you with the wind fields that are going to circulate the, the ash in the atmosphere. Um, the thing to remember about the atmospheric circulation, about the numerical weather prediction models, the NWP models, is that they don't actually have all of the uh, physics of the atmosphere in them. So there's, there can be pretty large problems sometimes in, in how, how uh, they show the ash moving in the atmosphere. Okay, so w we use these a lot. They're actually used operationally a very large amount by um, by volcanic ash advisory centers they're called that give out advisories to to aircraft um, but we got to keep in mind that they are uh, limited by the physics representation in the NWP models so they give us some idea what's what's going to go on in the atmosphere but uh, we got to just be cautious about it here's um here's a uh, at the time this was about 2010 I think where this was put together uh, these were uh, about at the, this was when ASH 3D was first made, I think, actually. But these are the list of the, the different, um, 
uh, ash dispersal models that existed in different uh, places. A lot of these are made by the weather services of different countries. Uh, for example, NAME is from the Met Office in the UK. Uh, Puff was originally used up in Anchorage. Uh, I think they're still using it for uh, backup. High Split is, is the US, um, major US model. Uh, Mocage is, or Mocage is uh, the main French model. MLDPO is um, uh, Canadian. So uh, lots of these from all over. This isn't even, all of it doesn't even have the Japanese model on it, for example. It's a, basically a tabulation of all, uh, all the different um, uh, ways the, that these different models act. Uh, so here's ASH3D that uh, Alexa talked about, and then Tefra2 that uh, Leah talked about. And again, these are all forward models. So they, they transport ash uh, in the atmosphere. Tefra2 is one of, the few, one of the only ones that does have an inverse modeling capability. Uh, that I think Leah might talk about tomorrow, I don't know. Um, uh, but, but that's actually pretty rare to have that inverse modeling capability. A lot easier to make a forward model, generally speaking. <coughs> um, the, uh, the approach there, if you can see that, can you guys see that in the back at all? Okay, there's a line called approach and it has uh, L's and E's in it mostly. Uh, that's for uh, the one thing that Alexa talked about, uh, they're called Lagrangian or Eulerian. Lagrangian means that uh, you follow particles as they're sort of moving in the atmosphere. Eulerian means that you take a, a control volume and you just see what's going on inside of that control volume. Those are the two main ways that you can set up the, the numerics of the model. I think the other main thing to, to look at, it, it does show whether they have deposition and uh, all that kind of thing. All the models pretty much have dry deposition, what's called just particles falling out by their own weight uh, without aggregating and, and out, without being flushed out by uh, atmosphere, uh, by meteorology. I think the coverage is perhaps an important line, though. That's the, ah, that one right there. <laughs> this line right here. And uh, there's a L, R, or G there, local, uh, regional, or global. So the models that have a G on them are, do, uh, are able to transport ash globally. So you could sort of get an idea of what would happen to the ash globally. Although once you get to those distances and times, you're uh, pretty iffy on what's, what's going to really go on. Uh, local and regional scales are usually pretty good in, in all these models. And notice uh, ASH3D is, does local, regional, global. TEFRA2, as Leah said, is mostly a local for, for local fallout. <clears throat> oh, so we did a benchmark of these a uh, few years back, and this is some of the output. It, this slide got washed out, but uh, in some cases you can sort of see the comparison of the, the different models. They just tried to put a, display them as, as similarly as possible. So for example, uh, on, on this line right here, you can see uh, blob of ash right here, this yellow blob, but in this model it's got a dog leg in it and wraps around like that. On this line it uh, doesn't even have that uh, eastern extension, mostly the southern extension, and then on this one it's got mostly the eastern extension with very little southern extension. So actually, and this is not even transported very far from the source, the benchmark was the Tekla 2000 eruption. And so the ash hasn't even gone very far, and it's, it's already uh, quite, quite differently dispersed uh, in the atmosphere. So you've got to take, take what these uh, output with a grain of salt a lot of the time. Just to show you an example of how, uh, like you were saying, John, how irregular this transport can be. Um, the different colors are different heights, so at different heights in the atmosphere, the the stuff does different things. I'm sorry? This is puff. Yeah. All the other ones would do the same thing, basically. Same type of thing, I should say. <laughs> Not the same thing exactly. Um, but uh, wind shear causes the different colors to get, get spread out. And then, as you can see, the wind pattern can be sufficiently complicated that, that the, the ashes, uh, if you're standing here in in Finland, 
and there's an ash cloud heading straight towards you from Iceland, it's really not clear whether ash is going to fall on your head uh, at any time in the future. So it, it is uh, extremely iffy and spotty what, what's going to happen at distance from the vent. When, if you're close to the vent, uh, you know, within 100, 150, 200 kilometers from the vent, yeah, it's pretty, pretty nicely uh, predictable. But once you get out here, no. Um, so a few years ago, I wanted to sort of get an idea of what the relationship was between how those weird shapes in the ash plume uh, compared to uh, uh, worked uh, compared to how big the eruption was. So, so if it was a big eruption, what would happen? And if it was a small eruption, how would the ash be carried in the atmosphere? So I uh, made a model that synthesized the atmospheric motions just to, in a simple way to to be able to get an idea of, of how these how the ash might spread, uh, and uh, the the thing about the atmosphere atmospheric motions is they're caused by the pumping in of energy from from the sun. So there's different amounts of energy in the atmosphere in different scales of motion. So these are different scales of motion on the x-axis here, different amounts of energy on the y-axis, just showing uh, where the most of the energy is pumped in at the global scale or at global like scales and that induces a huge amount of energy in these lo the, the large amount of flow around the, uh, the, the global scale or zonal scale flow around the earth. Uh, there's also energy pumped in a, at lo lower link scales. That's why there's this, this crook in the, in the graph here. Uh, these, are, these are induced by the earth's heating. So these are more induced by sort of uh, lifting type things. And, and so that causes a, uh, uh, this, this crook in the energy spectrum there. So on, uh, when, you when, you, when you do this, um, the, the upper panel is for a, a relatively small eruption, uh, starting in the blue here on both ends, and then the different colors are just different times. So uh, in the upper panel, that's a relatively small eruption where the, the plume came out, like in the Ayafiat Yolkut picture I showed you, where it really just ended up being a kind of a snake kind of looking thing. And then that gets moved by the atmosphere. In the lower picture, we have an umbrella cloud uh, that, that gets spread uh, with time. The atmospheric motion in both of these panels is exactly the same. There's no difference in the wind field in the, in the two panels. But for the small eruption, the, the result of the motions is that you just keep stretching and bending this noodle uh, as, it, as it goes away from the, the vent, and you just keep wrapping it around and all kinds of neat things. It makes beautiful shapes and everything. For the big eruption, because the scale of the uh, disturbance to the atmosphere is large relative to the scale of the motions in the atmosphere, it's like it just dis diffuses in the atmosphere. So the really big eruption clouds, like Pinatubo and things like that, really just show a lot of relative diffusion type behavior like this. Uh, small eruptions like Ayafiat Yokut or most eruptions that happen at any one time uh, show this bending noodle uh, type behavior. <coughs> it's very easy to uh, spread a very uh, large uh, eruption material from a very large eruption zonally uh, in the earth. Uh, difficult to do that with uh, material from a small eruption. Uh, all right, so. So that's the, the general picture to how eruption clouds act relative to the atmospheric circulation. The atmospheric circulation isn't simple, though. Uh, and we all know that it has jet streams. Uh, and uh, the jets are, are, uh, act a lot of the time uh, as boundaries to, to transport between different latitudinal bands within the Earth. So for example, when this polar jet is strong here, that actually acts as a, a mixing barrier between uh, low latitude regions, low and mid latitude regions. Uh, where is this? Yeah. Yeah, there it goes. Okay, low and mid latitude regions here, and uh, and polar regions. Okay, so uh, during uh, times when the atmosphere is relatively uh, calm, uh, that material can't mix between. Uh, these masses of air, air masses can't mix between the tropics and mid latitudes and the and the uh, polar latitudes. When the atmosphere gets disturbed, uh, what happens? What happens is these jets start to kink 
uh, and they get bigger and bigger amplitude waves in them, and then those waves actually uh, start breaking. And when these, w when these waves start breaking, that's when you can actually mix air from the, the low, lat low and mid-latitude regions into the, into the polar regions. Uh, so it's really important to, to, uh, to uh, get an idea of what's going to happen in ice cores um, based on this physics of these Rossby waves. These are the Rossby waves, these waves here. Uh, when they break, that's when you can get stuff mixed into the polar vortex. When they're not breaking, it's basically a barrier between mixing between low latitudes and, and high latitudes. If an eruption happens at a, 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 the wrong time of year then, these are annual cycles. If eruption happens at the, at the wrong time of year then in the tropics, that air is not going to mix into the polar latitudes uh, before all the ash falls out and you won't see any, any signal from that eruption. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea, this is, uh, these are uh, uh, pictures, uh, basically limb pictures looking across the surface of the earth at the, at the atmosphere. So these are big cumulonimbus clouds in these uh, pictures. Uh, the upper picture was 1984 and the lower picture is 1991. So after Pinatubo eruption, and every, all of us who were alive then remember that the sky looked radically different during the year or so following the Pinatubo eruption. So this is after the eruption. The bands in the atmosphere are, are the bands of ash from, from Pinatubo, from the June eruption. So they're persisting. They persisted for, for quite a while there. Notice one thing about them is the ash is really concentrated in layers in the atmosphere. That's because these are turbulent layers in the atmosphere where the ash is still being held in suspension. The layers between these bands are relatively calm air, and the ash can fall out pretty fast between those bands. Then it settles in the next band down that's turbulent. The ash persists there because it's uh, suspended, and then it falls out from that. So the ash is uh, in these very thin layers in the atmosphere uh, and only falls out uh, very slowly, uh, exponentially, in, when you have this turbulent suspension. So that's what keeps it up there for quite a long time, is that it's turbulently suspended in these in these bands for a while. If those, last, if those bands last long enough then and, and you get Rossby wave breaking, uh, you can actually transport that material from the low latitude regions into the polar regions. Is that, is that just the polar regions or is that? No, I, this is, I, I can't remember where it is, Alexa. This could have been anywhere almost though on Earth it was like that, yeah. uh, in the low, la low and mid latitudes. <clears throat> Okay, so this, uh, so that's one thing. That kind of stuff is not taken into account uh, pretty much at all in any of these NWP models or, or ash transport models. Uh, they don't quite have that, that kind of physics in them. Another kind of physics they don't have in them that's probably really important to actually getting the ash to hit the ground is what's called uh, tropopause folding. So this is where uh, you get fronts converging, and and you start to get you start to get a convergence zone that might might uh, result in uh, cyclogenesis. These can actually break up before you get a cyclone, and and uh, not result in any any uh, any actual weather uh, of that nature. But it's it's so it's a precursor to to cyclogenesis. The big thing about these is shown in uh, number two or number three, where you get the warm air lifting on the one side of the the fold and then the cold air descending on the other side of the, the fold. And if you've got ash that's up in the atmosphere here, this is going to bring that ash very rapidly out of the atmosphere and cause it to, to come out of the atmosphere very, very fast, much faster than you would expect if you didn't go through a, a system like this. Uh, so that's one, another thing that's not very well characterized in these models that does happen that, that causes, uh, uh, that can really affect the, the ash fallout. There's a number of other phenomena that we've been that a couple of groups have been looking at lately, which is this finger formation at the bottoms of the eruption clouds. Even when they're pretty dilute, sometimes you get these fingers of of concentrated ash and a little bit colder air that actually come down as kind of little baby plumes, and they can have huge trails of ash following them, and that can flush out a lot of ash at once. So. Uh, in addition to the aggregation mechanism that Alexa talked about, you get these other atmospheric phenomena that can flush out ash pretty fast. I'm talking too long here, it looks like. So um, let's take a look at a few, uh, a few uh, eruptions. So 
How do you pronounce this, Alexa? Kellett? Oh, I always say Kellett, but I, so I don't know. Does anybody actually know? What is it? Kalut. Okay, Kalut. Okay. So fantastic eruption this year. Earlier this year, made a beautiful umbrella cloud uh, that we'll show you, and then you'll see the umbrella cloud uh, drafting uh, being propagating off to the to the west. Oh, hey, <laughs> I lied. <laughs> okay. There it goes. So you get this um, umbrella cloud coming out. That spreads by gravity. And then that whole patch, just like I showed you in the, in the model picture, that whole patch gets drafted downwind uh, as a big lozenge in the atmosphere. Huh? That's Indonesia. Yeah. yeah. Everybody loved this eruption this year, yeah. Uh, and then the, 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 talking about the little noodle type uh, eruption clouds, this is Ayafiat Yokut again. And just showing you that shape uh, the volcano's right there, just showing you that, that long, elongated, noodle-like shape as it comes out, it gets drafted downwind very fast. No umbrella cloud uh, generation, but actually it's, it is spreading by gravity laterally in a crosswind direction in these. So that's, that is caused by gravity, uh, and then this is just the, the ambient wind motion. Eventually this gets detached from the volcano, and then that noodle bends and stretches and everything like I, like I showed you before. Again. If you're standing in one spot, it's hit or miss whether that's going to put ash over your head. <coughs> uh, kind of an intermediate case was Hudson from 1991. It produced a pretty, pretty big eruption cloud um, that did produce, you know, basically a subsequent um, uh, uh, ash cloud in the atmosphere. That's this thing. Uh, on different days, so each one of these patches is the ash cloud on different days. This illustrates uh, not only that uh, sl slight change and slight actually bending and, and stretching of the, the Hudson ash cloud. It's stretched out a whole bunch here. It's actually compressed here, stretches, breaks up here. They do all kinds of funny things in there. This is actually trapped in the polar vortex region. And it took about 11 days for it to go around the Earth, but it didn't, um, uh, didn't immediately, uh, wasn't immediately able to uh, put any ash into the uh, polar vortex. <clears throat> Pinatubo, going back to that one, big eruption. Uh, eventually, ultimately, uh, as I said before, because it was a big eruption, the scale of the eruption was big relative to the atmosphere. It was able to spread out in the <clears throat> tropics and mid-latitude regions uh, pretty rapidly, but it took it a while for the, the material, any material to find its way into the, the polar vortex. And, and you can see in these two pictures, particularly the ash is trapped in the low latitude bands. Okay, so initially plume spread is uh, gravity currents. Uh, small plumes tend to be noodles and big plumes tend to be balls, I guess you could say. Uh, all of them eventually become fully subjected to the atmospheric motions. Uh, the motions that, the atmospheric motions that control cloud motion uh, fall into a number of characteristic link scales, and that controls how the, that particular, any particular ash cloud gets dispersed in the atmosphere. The horizontal dispersion, the horizontal spread, is controlled by the nearly two-dimensional motions, whereas the ash settling is, is controlled really by the uh, vertical, ver vertical settling of the ash particles. The vertical motions in the atmosphere are very weak. <coughs> Um, the biggest scale motions, these uh, synoptic scale and almost global scale motions, uh, just basically just carry the ash along. It's the smaller scale motions that cause the noodles to wrap around and the ash to, the, in, in the case of a small eruption, or the ash to spread in the case of a, of a large eruption. Uh, yeah, and I think that's it. Those are the main points here. Okay, thank you.